this thing on. What's up YouTube and those watching through the Triple W? My name is Sergeant Frosty and welcome to the 31st episode of the NHP podcast. If I start playing with my hair, tell me to stop. So let's jump right into what I've been playing. And so I recently revisited Dead by Daylight, which is, if you remember... <laughs> or if, I guess if you've looked into my channel, it's the first video I ever uploaded was a review of Dead by Daylight. It's a very shitty video, so don't go and watch it. I believe it's actually the most viewed video on my channel, ironically. Um, but it's got horrible sound. It's got horrible gameplay footage. Um, there's a part where I start playing Willy Wonka music while people are being brutally murdered. It's it's a definitely a time. Um, but Dead by Daylight has changed a lot, and I think they've balanced the uh, killer and survivor um, rules a lot. I guess I should tell you a little bit about it. Basically, you play as a killer um, or a survivor, and you're trying to either escape or kill all your victims and sacrifice them to the spider god. It doesn't make a lot of sense, but, you know, eh, it's a horror game. Um, so, yeah, and then the killers have perks that they can unlock by... Um, playing more games and getting better and they can unlock like offerings that they can give to their god that will change how the level is structured there's a lot of really cool stuff you can do you, and as a survivor you can bring in items like flashlights that'll like you can blind them the the killer and stuff like that and uh it's a it's just a really cool game um and i think they've balanced out the killer and the survivors a lot more um since early access and i think that the game's a lot better, but at the same time, I've noticed that there's a lot of microtransactions um, being put into the game, and there's a lot of uh, um, sort of DLC surrounding it. I mean, it's nothing that's like game-breaking or pay-to-play, but it's still kind of sad to see this cool little independent game sort of be corrupted by this. Um, but yeah, that's, that's pretty much all I've been playing. Um, I've been looking at touching Borderlands recently. But I haven't really been having time to play a lot of video games. Um, but let's jump right into our first topic. Grand Theft Auto V is big again. I don't know how it happened. Don't ask me how. Fortune found me. Fate just crowned me. Um, but Grand Theft Auto V um, has this new mod out called Grand Theft Auto V Roleplay by this company, No Pixel. I'm not quite sure if it's like a company or what. But basically, it's this giant gta 5 online server where people just role play so there's people who role play in there's like gangs there's mafia there's people who are just taxi drivers paramedics shit like that it's really cool um and pretty much every big streamer um on twitch is playing this and it's insane it's like actually insane um um one of my favorite streamers back in the day when i used to play world of warcraft soda poppin um he is currently doing this series on YouTube um, of his Twitch streams. They're kind of like highlights that tell a more cohesive story. So if you want to check it out, uh, his name's Soda Poppin, and his series is Life of Kevin. I would really recommend it. That's how I found out about this. Um, but he plays this character that's sort of like new to Los Santos. And he, for example, let me tell you a little bit about his story. He, um, <laughs> he, uh, comes to Los Santos and calls a taxi because like the taxi drivers are other players he meets this guy Speedy who's like got this like really thick Hispanic accent and he's like hola how, how como estas amigo and shit and so uh he um he, he's like hanging out with Speedy because he doesn't know anyone else and he's like Speedy I really need a job but I want to like do good honest work and he's like oh no no i understand and so like, he's like I, I i can help you sell fruit and he's like well that that sounds like a really good honest way to to make a living and so he like straight up just adds crack to soda poppin's inventory i'm gonna call him chance that's what i know him as this is his first name um he adds crack to chances inventory's like i've i've never seen a white white guacamole before he goes oh trust me this is the best salsa out there and he's like uh okay i trust you speedy and so they take him to a corner after they went and go went and bought clothes and speedy's like oh yeah you look really good in that yeah that yellow hoodie and uh, they get to this corner and like these guys in green clothes show up and they're like what the fuck are you doing on our corner they fucking murder speedy 
and they kidnap Kevin and take him to like a beach. And they're like, what the fuck are you doing on our corner wearing yellow like that? And he's like, listen, listen, I have a severe anxiety condition. I, I'm about to pass out. <sighs> and like they never break character. And so like they end up robbing uh, Soda Pop and her chance. Um, and they take all of his shit, even his phone. And he like finds a way to call the police. And it's <laughs> it's really cool what they're doing. Like right now there's this whole storyline where... Uh, Chance just got a job at a vineyard, and uh, he uh, is trying to do good on his work still. Um, and there's this like old guy, this streamer named Vader, um, who plays this character Eugene. And Eugene, <laughs> this this motherfucker is a crazy old man who uh, believes he's been in 36 world wars. And, uh, you know, it's really cool. It's a cool system because, like, if your favorite streamer isn't on, there's another streamer that exists in this world that's playing a character you've probably met on another streamer's um, playtime. So it's just this really cool experience of where you can just live in this world vicariously through these streamers. And they're all doing really great work. And and none of them break character. They're all very professional about it. And there's, like, some really cool storylines going on that are so organic. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it's, it's this really cool thing that's, that's sort of emerged now. So if you get a chance, check it out. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a little biased, but I really like chances, um, streams. Um, but yeah, uh, I'll leave a link in the description to the life of Kevin series. Cause I, I, I literally just binge watched the entire thing. I loved it. Uh, the next topic is, all right, let's, uh, let's pour, pour a drink out. Cheers. PewDiePie has officially been decrowned by T-Series. Now, I know some of you probably don't care. Some of you probably do care. Some of you probably one side or the other. But it's a big deal because right now the youtube is now represented as their their top subscribe channel as this giant corporation and if you've watched this podcast before or watched anything i've sort of made um you know that i have a very strong opinion when it comes to corporations versus independent creators and more often than not almost 99 percent of the time i would choose an independent creator over a large corporation and it's the same reason why i love companies like cd project red which are these smaller companies that make really great stuff and uh and recently if you know anything about youtube which is where i get a lot of my entertainment um that they've been sort of trying to i don't know push back their independent creators Um, There's a reason why people go on YouTube and watch content, and that's because they love independent creators, and they love seeing things from people's perspectives that they normally wouldn't get to see. It's a reason why people like Red Letter Media and, you know, McJuggernuggets and um, PewDiePie get to do the things they want to do. And the fact that, you know, all of these giant companies like fucking Jimmy Kimmel and Ellen DeGeneres, you know, started coming on, um, YouTube and sort of taking over the platform. Um, you know, people weren't really worried at first cause like, who's going to watch that? Um, but you know, YouTube is really supporting them and really taking their side. And, you know, it's kind of sad to see this company that was built upon, these independent creators of people just wanting to voice their 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 opinions and their ideas and their cool concepts um they're slowly being shadowed out by the people that gave them the platform it's like these people gave you a platform you guys used it which boosted their platform which boosted your platform and now these guys they don't really give a fuck about you they just want Jimmy Kimmel and Ellen DeGeneres to fucking piss on them for about 60 hours a day and then they're just gonna ask for some more while these people here are just fucked and you know if you heard about the adpocalypse all these youtubers that are you know trying to make a living doing creative content and trying to create new mediums are are just getting insanely fucked 
and it's it's really sad um, to see that that YouTube is a hundred percent on the side of these giant corporations. And so, if you haven't been following PewDiePie, who's the number one subscribed YouTuber on the platform, he used to do gaming videos. Now he does like commentary videos. I am not a fan of PewDiePie. I've never been a fan of PewDiePie. I don't think I've watched a single one of his videos until like last year. Um, I just was not really into Let's Play videos. Like I didn't watch Markiplier or Jacksepticeye or any of the big Let's Play channels. Um, but when this whole thing came up about PewDiePie versus T-Series, it was like, so there's this giant company, T-Series, in India, and India has this new access to internet, so all these people are joining and finding out what YouTube is, and they're basically being propagandized all this shit on T-Series um, all around India. Like, apparently T-Series is, like, as big as fucking the Kardashians here. <laughs> And and it and so basically people are like automatically subscribe to T series as soon as they make a YouTube account. And they're so heavily marketed in India and and so it was like this giant corporation that abuses the YouTube algorithm um by posting like fucking twenty videos a day. Apparently some of their earlier stuff was like pirated music and shit. Um and it, it's just like there was just this giant battle between people who wanted an independent creator to be the number one. Like, we we always knew that T-Series was going to pass, but we were hoping that PewDiePie would get to at least 100 million, so, like, the, the last biggest milestone pretty much ever achievable on YouTube would have been an independent creator, but I don't think that's going to happen now. I mean, it, like, people were doubting it, but once PewDiePie hit, like, 91... I was like, shit, we might actually do this. Um, but then, you know, all of these YouTubers were, like, buying billboards and shit. And it was this world spread move, this internet spread movement to get PewDiePie to 100 million before T-Series. And uh, so, yeah. Anyways, the other day, it officially ended. The fight, we lost. It was a good battle. But, uh, yeah. So now T-Series is the uh, number one subscribed YouTube channel on YouTube. But I think in the hearts of all the people who really care about this platform, um, it, it stands for independent creators. And for people who don't care, for people who don't care about free speech or free thought or the spread of opinions and ideas of others they can keep watching John Oliver and Jimmy Kimmel for all I care because eventually another platform will come along and people will move there and it's going to get corrupted by the same people and then we'll move to another one and then we'll all die from climate change. <laughs> but uh, if you, if you want to, if you want to sort of closure to this whole thing, um, PewDiePie released a, a song called Congratulations. Um, so if you want to go check that out, uh, that that was a pretty, f that, I thought it was really good. Um, it's a cool video. I'll probably put it in the description next to the Life of Kevin stuff. Uh, so moving on to movie review of the week. So if you remember from last week, I said that I would give you the movie, and then we'd talk about it this week, and then I'd give you another movie, and we'd talk about that one next week. And so I did. I went and I watched Velvet Buzzsaw actually earlier today. Um, and so now we're going to talk about it. So this year, there there hasn't been a lot of like movies that have excited me. There's movies I still want to see, like Alita Battle Angel. But uh, out of the, like, the five movies I've seen this year, two of them, well, one of them I hated. One of them I was like, it's a whatever. Um, oh, yeah, and then Lego Movie. I forgot about that one. That was all right. Um, but then the three movies I've liked this year, Happy Death Day to You, I gave it like a 7 out of 10, it was a really fun movie, great experience, maybe it's an 8, I can't remember, Us, which was a fantastic film, great cinematography, great um, technical direction, great soundtrack, I wasn't the biggest fan of the uh, third act, but other than that, it's a great film, and then Velvet Buzzsaw, this movie has terrible reviews, people universally just don't like it. And after I saw the trailer, I was like, how is that possible? First of all, Jake Gyllenhaal, it's a, uh, a f 
Dan Gilroy film. I was trying to remember the name of the director. Um, I, I didn't think it could be that bad, and I finally just sat down and watched it. And, yeah, I'm looking at 64% on Rotten Tomatoes, 61 on Metacritic, 5.7 on IMDb. How is that fucking possible? Um, from the man who made Nightcrawler. Um, but somehow it is, and so this is my opinion of it. Now, I'm expecting that all of you went and watched this film in the last week, but, you know, I I can't expect everything from you guys. So, um, I will let you know this movie has spoilers, or this, this review has spoilers, um, because there's so much I want to cover in this film. Um, but let's just start right off with my overall opinion of it. I fucking loved it. This is my favorite movie of the year right now. Um, yeah, it was, it was, it was fucking amazing. Um, I want to start with the performances. Jake Gyllenhaal, amazing as always. He like stole every scene. I think the biggest problem with Jake Gyllenhaal in a movie is that he's just too fucking good. And the, the caliber of acting you need to... <laughs> balance out Jake Gyllenhaal's acting is insane because there were a couple scenes in this film where Jake Gyllenhaal was just giving it his all <laughs> and the other people in the room I just don't think could keep up with it and I think it was partly to do with the character because Jake Gyllenhaal plays this like bisexual over the top stereotypically flamboyant art critic and he's just like all over the place like there's this scene where he's talking to you know this girl that he was in love with and he's just like, he's like, tell me that there was not something between us <laughs> or not something special. And she's like, she's like, I, I, I can say that it was less than exciting or something like that. And the guy, the guy behind them, who she's now dating, um, was just like, Ooh, that's rough. And, and <laughs> Jake Gyllenhaal is just like making this face. He's just like, And that being said, everyone in this film is overacting. And I've said it before, and I'll say it again. Overacting is fucking amazing, as long as everyone is doing it. If, like, half of your cast is overacting, and no one else is, it doesn't work. If only one character is overacting, unless it's, like, a specific character thing, it just doesn't work. Overacting has to be a universal thing that everyone's on board with. And at first, I thought that the girl who plays Josephine, the uh, the the main girl, almost the main character, uh, Za Ashton, Josephina. Um, I I thought for a while that she probably had the weakest performance, but as the movie went on, her character developed, and she was becoming more and more over. Like she was overacting more and more. You know, she starts out as probably the most normal character, other than. Uh, Natalia, the the fucking Stranger Things person, um, and uh, you know she starts out. She seems like the most normal person, and then like as it's going on, she's just like everything around me is just it's just being ruined. It's 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 honestly great, and there's so much to explore with this film. Oh, and and Tony Collette gives an an, an amazing performance. You know, I, I didn't really like Hereditary, but her performance in that movie was f was phenomenal. Um, John Malkovich did great. Rene Russo did an amazing job, and, and and she was amazing in Nightcrawler as well. And can I just point out that Nightcrawler was directed by uh, Dan Gilroy and star Jake Gyllenhaal and Rene Russo, and this movie is directed by Dan Gilroy and is starring um, Jake Gyllenhaal and Rene Russo. They pulled it off again. I don't think I like this movie as much as Nightcrawler, considering Nightcrawler is, like, one of my favorite movies of all time. Like, easily top 20. But they they pull it off again in this film. They they have such great chemistry. Um, but anyways, so I digress. This movie has a lot to do about art and corruption. Um, basically, everyone in this film has to do with the art industry. So there's art critics like Jake Gyllenhaal. There's art dealers like Rene Russo and Za Ashton. Um, and then there's there's artists like uh, John Malkovich and um, the guy from Blind Spotting. I can't remember his name. I actually haven't seen Blind Spotting. Uh, David Diggs. 
don't know if there's just an extra E in there or what. But, uh, yeah, so, and then throughout the movie, um, basically this artist whose paintings are being sold by these people who requested that his art be destroyed um, is haunting these people in the art world. And as the film goes on, anyone who profits from his art uh, is slowly being um, killed. But they're not being killed in in normal ways. They're being killed in a way that turns them into art to the point where, like, literally they, they cannot appreciate art, therefore they will become it so they can learn what it is. And they talk about earlier in the film about how the artist of these paintings believed that you have to almost give your life to create art and he would use his own blood um and there's sort of it imp- it's implied that he uses the um blood of his victims like his father to make the paintings as well um and uh that so he, he used to say that you should give your life to your art you should devote your life to your art to the point where your spirit becomes a part of it and so therefore all of these people that are profiting off of art are being destroyed essentially and turned into art itself and one of the things that i think works so well about this movie is the pacing because there's quite a bit of time in between the killings so it gives you enough time where like this person dies in this sort of horrific like supernatural way and then there's this time where you forget that this movie is a supernatural film and you're you're back with the characters and and someone died and and then it's about these characters again and then another horrific supernatural thing happens and you're like oh yeah i forgot this is a horror movie and normally when you forget the genre of a film that's a bad thing but it, it works so well because it's still horrific you know if you if you have like a movie that like constantly builds suspense and constantly you know builds this stuff and it doesn't have that much of a payoff it just doesn't work but in this case it does because you know um it's about these real these characters that are real and they go through their day-to-day lives and these people are dying around them and they're so oblivious to it because they're so oblivious to the corruption and the um the damage they're doing to art itself by being the way they are and as someone who is so passionate about art um in in sort of the um superficial sense in the um metaphorical sense you know i i love this analogy to corruption in art and how art will always overcome it and eventually it will it will kill corruption because the thing is art is everything and art is everywhere and you know, Zoe, Zoe, Za, fucking hell, that's why I pulled up the cast, uh, Za Ashton's character, um, eventually gets murdered by the graffiti that she so heavily despises and, and criticizes, um, you know, because she doesn't believe it's real art, yet she is killed and turned into it, um, and so that's why I think this film is way beyond the mind's of most people and I think that's why it was downvoted and people didn't like it because it didn't have enough jump scares or something like that I don't know I didn't understand the response to it I thought it was fucking amazing I loved it and I think in the next few years it's going to become one of my favorite films um 64 by critics 36 by audience I get that but I would have thought critics would have rated it a lot higher. Um, That's, that's just very surprising to me. Um, I I thought this would have resonated a lot with critics since their whole job is, is to, to love and appreciate art, but I guess they're more like morph from uh, this film, which is Jake Gyllenhaal's character. But I want to go through each of the, the kills in the movie. So it starts out the first kill, if I remember correctly, is uh, is the assistant, and he tries to steal the art for his own, for him his own self, but he's actually in the act of hiding away art to increase the value of um, the art. So they would be like, "Oh, we found some extra ones like a couple years down the road because he was dead, and it was like this big fad." So like, "Oh, we'll create scarcity so that they are worth more." 
Um, and so he, he ends up getting killed by a painting of apes. But I have to talk about the fact that his death was probably the most horrific because he starts out, he's, he just gets like burnt all over and you're just, you kind of feel it. And he ends up crashing his car and the paintings get lit on fire and he's like, shit, shit, shit. And so he goes into this gas station where he gets like almost just pulled into this painting of, of chimpanzees playing poker. And, but I like the sort of the comparison of him to, uh, being an ape or a, a worker chimp because um, he's he's sort of just doing the bidding of all this corruption at the lowest level and it's kind of ironic that he's the first to go and then the second one is this art dealer of this other um uh art gallery the one that's like Rene russo's biggest enemy and he ends up getting hung by um his tie um And I, I, I sort of perceive this as, um, well, he was killed because he was trying to use um, this artist's past to decrease the value of his art. Um, I, I haven't really processed his death that much, um, or the analogy to his death. Um, but then the next one is, is Toni Collette, who um, sort of uses sh her position to... Uh, discredit others and sort of um take take hold of of the art world or the immediate art world to her power and control and she gets killed by this thing called the sphere it's this like piece of artwork that has like these machines that'll make you feel certain things and everyone will have a different feeling based on you know who they are and what they're currently feeling at that moment and it'll tell you something about yourself and uh she puts her arm into the hole and it basically her entire like arm gets just sh fucking shredded like blood is just pouring and splurting out of all the different holes in the sphere um and sort of her ego and her um her yeah her ego is being sort of ripped into a million pieces and and you know it's 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 really beautiful and then the best part about that one is that Pete, i was just fucking dying people thought I was part of the art exhibit and there's like these little school children walking around in the blood thinking it's part of the, the art exhibit I loved it and then uh the next two was obviously the one I talked about previously were Z Za Ash I, I don't know what her fucking name is um she gets turned into graffiti um and Jake Gyllenhaal sadly dies because the thing is I, I felt bad for Jake Gyllenhaal because he realized that he was he fucked up and like this was really fucked up and to be fair he didn't know what was going on but he was being turned into a uh well he he got killed by the robot that he discredited at the beginning of the film um and so they were talking about how you know he he loves certain artists but he doesn't give them good reviews because of personal interest um or you know how he destroys people's lives because of his 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 critiques and uh so he ends up getting murdered by the thing that he essentially murdered um at the beginning of the film which i thought was very cool and ironic um and rene russo ends up getting um killed at the very end by the velvet buzzsaw um which i thought was a great ending to the film um, because she she believes she can escape everything. She's the biggest con artist in this entire film, arguably the antagonist of the film, um, and she thinks she's safe because she's she's taken art out of her life, and the tattoo on the back of her uh, the back of her yeah shoulder turns into a real buzzsaw and kills her, which is sort of um, her past. She used to be a musician in a band called Velvet Buzzsaw her past uh art that she quits for the fame and for the for the much she, she quits her desire to create art to become rich essentially and be an art curator and so basically her greed bites her in the back and her own art kills her um in the end which i thought was just fucking beautiful i i loved this film so much and then the artists at the end the um david david grease or fucking hell i feel like i feel like i should be more educated on the names of these people but like and nah, nah nah uh david diggs 
um, he's sort of this inner city artist that does graffiti work and they were going to do his stuff in the museum and at, at the, near the end of the film he decides to pull his art and he's like fuck it I'm done I'm done with this shit I want to be an artist not a fucking show pony and he um, goes back to the inner city to do his art and he sort of that's when he chooses his art over fame and money and and the glory of it all and the ego and and so he gets to live same with john malkovich who is so fed up with this art world he goes and this is so beautiful he goes and he 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 has to create art for him so he does it in the sand he creates art in the sand that will eventually get washed away by the wave so no one will ever see it except for him and he created it for him so it doesn't matter if it gets washed away because he saw it he created it the more i talk about this film the more i fall in love with it over and over again uh the, the acting is on point the direction is on point probably the only section of the film i didn't really care for was the the scene where the other antagonist art curator guy dies because i felt like it had didn't have a lot of um weight to it um and then in the meantime, there's this this assistant played by the girl who plays Nancy Wheeler from <laughs> Natalia Dyer. She plays Nancy Wheeler in Stranger Things. And the whole movie, I was like, who the hell is that? I know that person. And it was the Stranger Things girl. Um, but, uh, yeah, she she's the assistant of, like, she starts out as the assistant of, of Rene Russo, and then she gets fired, so she moves to the other art curator, who dies. So then she becomes the assistant of Tony Collette, who dies. And then she becomes the assistant of Jake Gyllenhaal, who fucking dies. She walks around the corner and sees Jake Gyllenhaal's dead body, and she just goes, fuck. <laughs> and, and so, you know, she she's sort of this... Uh, I find I found her kind of the comedic relief because you're sort of seeing the world through the eyes of her, um, and so I thought that was really cool. Um, so overall, this film was was amazing. Um, probably my only downs in the film is that a lot of times it feels like that we're just being thrown into a scene, which I kind of understood at the same time because the whole movie felt like each scene was sort of a canvas in itself. And it was this. It was its own piece, its own moment. Um, it felt a lot like a play, and so I felt like a lot of times we were thrust into scenes, sort of like a picture or like a, a painting. Um, but I could just be reading way too much into it. Um, it could just be bad writing. Um, but other than that, you know, the acting was spot on. I, I loved everything about this movie except for that sort of being thrusted into a scene. Um, I, I give this film a nine out of 10. It's my favorite film of the year so far. I, I, I loved it to death. And I think that it's insanely, insanely underrated. So next week, I'm going to be talking about lame is Rob, which is one of my favorite movies ever. So I'm excited about that. So, um, if you, if you want to, uh, watch the review next week, and be fully in on the conversation. Uh, go ahead and watch Les Mis by next week. And uh, we can we can have a nice talk about it. So if you've seen Velvet Buzzsaw, let me know what you thought down there. Because that was the whole point of having both of us watch it. So I can voice my opinion and then you can voice your opinion um, in the comments below. And uh, so I think I think it'll be a really fun thing to, to sort of be on the same basis with these movie reviews. Instead of it just being a random movie. Um... Also, this week, two movies are coming out that I really want to see. One is Beach Bum. Three. Beach Bum comes out, which is about Matt McConaughey, who's a writer, like a fucking heroin addict writer, which looks really fun. Um, Pet Cemetery looks really good, too, with John Lithgow. And then oh, The Best of Enemies, starring Sam fucking Rockwell. Anytime I can see a film with Sam Rockwell in it, I'm 100% in. So pumped for that. I love Sam Rockwell to death. Like, honestly, if I could talk about... <laughs> if I could name the three best working actors today, it would be Jake Gyllenhaal, Sam Rockwell, and Leonardo DiCaprio. Because, like, holy shit. Jake Gyllenhaal's 
amazing in everything, as well as Sam Rockwell and, of course, Leonardo DiCaprio. So the next segment is a new segment I want to do on the show called um, The Thing No One's Heard Of. And so this could be a movie. This could be a game. Um, I have a couple games that I, I have lined up for this series. But basically, I want to talk about a game or a movie that no one's heard of or, like, no one really talks about that I, I really love. And so this week, I want to talk about a game called A Story About My Uncle. It's a first-person platformer where you play as this kid. I believe it's only available on Steam as well. Um, but it's, like, ten bucks. Um, you play as this kid who is in his uncle's... Uh, attic his uncle's an inventor and he finds a portal to another world and uh basically you go through these platforming stages in this other world and you have this little glove and it has this tether and you can you can use it to tether to things and then throughout the game you'll unlock more tether so you can link it up so you can shoot this tether up and it'll hit a rock and then you can pull yourself up and then launch yourself to another rock um and then you like learn new abilities and the platforming is amazing and the story is really interesting too because there's this whole race of people in this world that have met your uncle and they're like yeah your uncle is really cool what he's, he's missing and so you end up meeting this little girl and she she goes on this adventure with you and so she's always talking to you while you're doing these platforming things and it's just a really well crafted game it's really fun it's about like a five hour game but then after that there's like so many collectibles to find like recordings of your uncle um and and so you can go through and do platforming challenges to try and find it and uh and then also one of my favorite parts is the time trials because like you think you're good at the game when you finish it you're not because <laughs> the time trials add so much more playability to it and honestly it's it's one of the best games i've ever played i i can tell you right now i think it's in my top 20 or something like that and you guys think i'm joking about but i literally have every game i've ever played uh ranked obviously it's not like every single game is ranked exactly story about my uncle is my 27th favorite game i've ever played out of 363 so it's really a great game i love it so i'll probably put a link to that too in the description um but yeah so um that about sums it up before i jump into the top five of the week um and this week we're gonna be doing since you know we talked about velvet buzzsaw and jake gyllenhaal I want to do the top five Jake Gyllenhaal performances. Um, I'm not going to include this one, even though I do think it's one of his best performances ever, um, because it's so new and fresh in my head. So number five is Zodiac. He plays Robert Grayson, a cartoonist. If you haven't heard of Zodiac, it's directed by David Fincher, and it's about the Zodiac murders. It's got Robert Downey Jr., Mark Ruffalo, and uh, Jake Gyllenhaal. It's a, it's a great film. Um, and the reason why I think this is one of Jake Gyllenhaal's best performances is because you slowly see him lose his mind as he becomes obsessed with this Zodiac killer. And as everyone is starting to just give up on it, he is just getting more interested and more enthralled. And you start to lose your mind along with him. And Jake Gyllenhaal gives this really amazing performance where you almost feel like you are him. Um, and it's just done so well. Number four is Donnie and Donnie Darko. If you haven't seen Donnie Darko, I suggest it. I think it's one of the best psychological thrillers out there, and I think not a lot of people talk about it. I think it's kind of one of those forgotten films. Um, but Jake, I don't want to actually. I don't want to say anything about it because I don't want to spoil it. Um, but it, it it's it's a really great film, and Jake Gyllenhaal gives it very chilling performances. This is one of his like first films. Uh, the same thing with Enemy. I don't want to say a lot about it at all because I want you, you to experience it for what it is. But he plays Adam Bell, this actor who sees um, almost a doppelganger of himself. Um, or sorry, he, he sees a doppelganger who's an actor um, uh, of himself. And he uh, is sort of searching to try and figure out what it's all about. That's all I'm going to say. I can say more about the next two, though. Number two is Prisoners, Detective Loki oh my god you think that in a story about what humans would do if their kids were um taken the the shining stars would be the parents and and don't get me wrong viola davis terrence howard hugh jackman do an amazing job this movie is phenomenal but 
Jake Gyllenhaal, for me, just steals the show. There's something about him. He just has this presence where you can see that the case is slowly eating at him, that he's never failed a case, and this is the one that's going to get him. And he just, he, you can just see the weight on his shoulders the entire film. And when you finally get to that final sequence where, you know, he's he's got blood in his eyes. He's driving down the street at like 80 miles an hour. It, the man gives a performance of a lifetime. Now, out of all of these films, only one, only one movie could easily take it there was no other movie i would ever think about putting that as as jake gyllenhaal's best performance except for this one and of course that's prince of persia the sands of time (laughs) i'm joking i'm joking it's nightcrawler lou bloom jake gyllenhaal doesn't only just give an amazing performance from an acting standpoint from a physical standpoint he doesn't even look like jake gyllenhaal in that movie and he plays this creepy fuck but yet you're so intrigued and in love with his character you like love to hate him but hate to love him he's one of those characters he's kind of like uh christian bale in american psycho um he plays this guy who records um crimes at night and then he sells them to um the news stations and then he starts this sort of weird creepy romantic relationship with Rene russo um and he just he's this character that is just so intriguing and you are just so captivated by him and he's so charismatic that he fools almost everybody in the film and he fools the audience so by the time the movie rolls credits you don't know what you just witnessed all you know is that you were you want to be along for the ride that takes place after the credits roll and basically jake gyllenhaal is a fucking god that's (laughs) that's that's all i gotta say (laughs) so thank you so much for watching this film and i will see you in the next episode of the nhp podcast adios senor